the big thing for me is the stress. Yeah. You put yourself in situations where you have to do well in like really high pressure moments that have a lot of big equity. So it could be one singular decision really matters. And if it doesn't work out, it's it's so stressful. I'm gonna give it all I got, all I got, I'm grinding every day, ain't no other way. Embrace the Grind, season two, chapter two, the sequel with my bro, Andrew Moreno, the show where we talk about poker we talk about all the things that i'm interested in my life all the things that you're interested in your life talk about grinding grinding embracing yeah. the grind business content creation so many different things I, i'm actually picking up photography now so there's a lot of things that will come up in the course of this show but basically we talk a lot about poker that's kind of like the main focus here but well, at least uh, right now the world series is happening right now especially so, right yeah. now the world series we actually took a long break in that time i a lot has happened. I mean, you had a baby. Yep. He's now 11 months old. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why we took a break here, but I'll, I'll cover a few of them with, that were kind of the big ones. First of all, I went to LA to shoot an Embrace the Grind episode on location at the Hustler Casino and got everything set up. You know, it's a, it's a lot to move all these microphones, lights, cameras, everything, audio equipment. And it, it went great. Like the, the interview with uh, Ryan Feldman, the guy who started Hustler Live went really well, so I was really excited for it. Came home to edit it, and I lost all the audio. Evidently didn't click the save button or something and packing everything up, you know, because my workflow was all messed up. So I don't know if you can relate to this, but I'm gonna try to re relate it to people at home. So like, let's say, remember when you were in school and you had to write a paper that was like maybe like 10 pages or something, and you got through like seven pages of it and you were like so happy with how you were, everything was going along with it. And then all of a sudden like your computer crashed or froze and it didn't save or something and you had to start all over again. That's kind of how I felt with Embrace the Grind. That's terrible, bro. I feel bad. I didn't realize that actually happened. I um, never actually told you that either. Another thing that happened was is we had some, Olga and I had some issues with our living situation. We were filming Embrace the Grind over at another apartment here at Panorama. It was a rental. And with the real estate market being so hot, the owner wanted to sell the place. So he was like, oh, you guys have to go. I, I want to sell. So that, which is fine. We weren't in a position to buy that place. So we decided to rent another place at the Martin. Long story short, we ended up getting kicked out of the Martin 24 hours after moving in. And I, as you know, everyone knows, moving is a tough process it's it involves a lot of things we didn't hire movers or anything so especially in a high rise like you're moving things up and down 29 floors or this this was 11 floors that we went down we moved across the street here in vegas to the place called the martin it's really close by 29 floors up you know i had a couple friends helping and stuff but it was just so deflating and devastating when they told us that we had to go uh, and it's not something that we really, we really could argue. They actually disabled our fobs. And there's no way that you're going to get up and down 20 nights of, 29 flights of stairs without access to a fob or something. So you weren't here for that, but it was definitely a tough thing that we had to go through. So with that happening, not having a place to film the Embrace the Grind episodes, being kind of like in limbo on where we were going to even be for a while, I just decided to shut it down for a while. But... One of the things that's been happening at the World Series of Poker more recently is because I've been playing a lot of tournaments is one of the things that people say all the time is I really miss your Embrace the Grind episodes. Yeah, I've actually heard the same thing and it, it made me miss it, you know, because I feel like we it's just my brother and I having a conversation about what's going on in, in our lives, in the world and uh, the things that we're working on. And, you know, it kind of made me realize that we haven't been able to do that much. Yeah, I mean, life life moves at you fast, especially when you're having a kid. Uh, we wanted to film one the other day, and we brought Miles over here. Yeah, and he was running amok. You know, he was not really uh, in the mood to. I mean, as all eleven months old, eleven months yeah. are. You know, like he wasn't in the mood to let us just have a casual conversation. Yeah, um, definitely not. And then with me, you know, not having like a stable place to move in to live and set up, we actually set up. Okay, so now story comes full circle. Mm -hmm. We're in a new apartment and a new living room at Panorama. So we're back at the original place that we were at. Not the original apartment, original building though. And we really love this building. So many great perks about living here. 
turn the living room into a studio, rearrange the living room so that it's a nice little studio area. I'm going to leave it arranged like this so that we can film episodes impromptu whenever. And so we should be able to get some more episodes out. We should be able to talk uh, semi-regularly. I know, obviously, we've been here all summer, and I've been playing tournaments every day. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much every day for me as well. And so, like, mixing in, making an episode of Embrace the Grind, I was taking a back seat. I was doing daily Instagram reels that were talking about, um, basically, like, my win-loss for the summer. And, um, yeah, so that was taking up a ton of time. But now that the World Series is winding down, I wanted to sit down for a couple episodes Happy to be back. I mean, like I said, so much of stuff has happened. The financial world has melted down uh, in a lot of ways. The economy. Yeah. Hey, uh, economy's not doing so well. Um, <clears throat> I was heavily involved in some NFTs. Yeah. Uh, you could probably see over my shoulder here, there's a picture of an ape that you can see the bottom of it. That ape made me a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, One thing I found really interesting about your ape, so um there was a big kind of melting in the crypto market and a lot of the values of the big crypto uh bitcoin ethereum were going down but also the bored apes were were peaking and then they were starting to come down a little bit yeah and you were looking at potentially getting out of it before you you saw this big kind of crash coming and um one thing that i found really interesting was that your ape specifically has a russian flag on its hat yeah it's a little like uh Russian yeah like a like the old school like Russian commie hat yeah and you guys like that originally you got it your wife is obviously Russian and you've been to Russia to see your family so that was really cool for you guys to get that ape but it was kind of made it a bit harder to sell or I thought it did or that it like the value of that ape was a little bit less because of the the Russia and Ukraine thing. I actually, it's funny that you say that. I actually thought that because I put it up for sale and I had it up for sale for about a month and it wasn't getting the price that I wanted. And it was right when the Ukraine Russia thing was going down. And I thought that like having the Russian hat could uh, be a deterrent for people wanting to buy it. But um, the reason why I ended up getting it in the first place is because I thought that this particular NFT project was the best iteration of building a global brand a pop culture brand something like a supreme or a louis vuitton in the early stages obviously it's not going to be a louis vuitton louis vuitton's been around since the 1800s but the the first time where this um mechanism to own part of the company which was purchasing an nft uh there was 10,000 nfts uh individually and even though it was like a picture and everybody's like oh you're you're buying a picture of an ape it's just like that's what you own really what it was is you were buying into a brand and it was your membership into this brand and originally i thought that this brand had a chance to be like the next supreme with like clothing drops i was seeing that their hats that they that they were selling were selling out instantly you could only buy them if you held the nft if you were part of the community and then the people were selling those hats on ebay for like twenty five hundred dollars it's like reminded me of supreme you know how like people would pile up on supreme and then be a reseller for it so i was like wow they're really hacking pop culture number one they could really turn into be a global uh like clothing brand and i wanted in on it because i thought that it was going to be the first time that like i could invest in a brand that was going to be super cool and and have its finger on the pulse of pop, pop culture and it was like that for a while, like their clothing drops were selling out and people were buying them on eBay. But then I noticed that the company started going in a little bit of a different direction than I wanted them to go. I, and as like a shareholder, I'm like, you know what? I'm not really agreeing with what they're doing. The things that I wasn't agreeing with was they decided to not really focus on in real life stuff. Like they, they weren't really releasing clothes. They weren't like building out actual physical products for their brand they were kind of moving into the metaverse and like building their own metaverse and that just didn't interest me you know i'm like i'm in my 40s now and i don't really care about the metaverse you know you're more of an irl guy i'm more of an in real life guy so <laughs> once i saw like 
the whole metaverse angle and you know i i ended up getting a plot of land in this metaverse they gave it to me for holding the ape i bought all the merch started reselling some of the merch to make some money they gave me ape coin which ended up making me over a hundred thousand dollars just off of the ape coin alone and you know i was like i feel like because i'm not really aligned where with the direction the brand is going and uh, not overly excited about that, that I should probably just get out, you know? Yeah. And so I decided to sell at a pretty good time. I sold it for uh, 94 ETH. And at the time, ETH was worth around $2,800. And I decided to convert some of that ETH into USDC, uh, about $150,000 worth at around 2200 a coin. So I ended up making like a good amount of money. And Unfortunately, right after that is when the crypto market like melted down. Yeah, uh, you you were just a you're a hodler, right? Yeah, I'm just a hodler because I don't I don't know enough to uh, do anything else, and I've made some mistakes in the past. I uh, when Bitcoin first tumbled during quarantine or the pandemic, uh, I sold all my Bitcoin. Uh, I had like around seven Bitcoin. I sold at like four thousand. And then it went up to 60K shortly after. And, and I realized after that, like, I believe in this. I wanted to hold it. I wanted to have it. I want to be a part of it. I'll just buy it and hold it uh, and just not not try to be something I'm not. Like, I'm not a trader. I don't understand how the markets work. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I do have some some Bitcoin and ETH now. I'm considering buying more uh just give, given the state of the market but uh yeah it's pretty bloody out there right now yeah i um i i'm kind of right there with you i'm not a trader i i actually made some money trading apecoin uh because i i noticed a pattern of when these projects would drop coins or they would drop uh certain like perks uh that paid out in real real value that initially there was like a drop in price where people would just like get rid of it and then there would be a run-up in the next couple days and that's exactly what happened with ApeCoin. As soon as ApeCoin dropped, it, it dropped down to like $7. And then there was a run up to 20. So I actually set sell orders all the way up to $19 and was able to clear pretty well. But that's the, the extent of the trading that I've ever done. Bitcoin, I've just been hodling. I've been acquiring ETH and just holding it, except for the time that I made the money off of the Ape and converted it to USDC. But yeah, it is bloody out there. So bloody that a lot of these crypto companies have been dying. NFT market's dead. Uh, there was this big thing with uh, Voyager is going down. Uh, Luna really wrecked the market. And so many people yeah. believed in Luna. Uh, for, the, for you guys that don't know the Luna story, basically it was a stable coin that lost its peg. It lost its, its, uh, its mark on a dollar. And, and once that happened, it, it triggered a death spiral. And everybody was trying to get out at the same time. And so many people lost money. People are saying that it's really contributed to the downfall of the market. The big news in the poker world, CoinFlex, a company that mm -hmm. Doug Polk has been touting and promoting. Also, people are mad at him. People yeah. are really mad at him. Uh, and I'm, I have some mixed feelings on this. I, I would say that overall, I don't think that Doug did anything wrong per se here just because he did his due diligence and he accepted a sponsorship from a company that in good faith that he thought was doing the right thing. And it turns out that a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money, most likely. And people are upset with him, right? Yeah. Rightfully so on some level. And I think that if he didn't have the history of really like bashing people like Phil Hummuth wearing his Bitcoin Latinum hat, um, Dan Bilzerian, like for whatever reason, I don't even know what yeah. he, but you know, basically he's come after a lot of people and you, <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah. He's come after me. Yeah. Um, but basically I think because of that, because he's so quick to like make videos about other people talking yeah. bad about other people, especially in a lot of cases, like the people have done no wrongdoing. He just like does things to like really marketing and get clicks. Now that it, the roles have reversed, um, it's, I can see why people are coming after him, yeah. but I'm going to take the high road here. And even though he's came after me, I don't think that it's really too been too much of his fault. I think that it's, uh, it's just a really unfortunate thing. And it sounds like he's going to lose money on the, on the deal as well. Um, yeah. So like, like I said, the crypto market has been insane 
the, the the real the real world markets too have been pretty bad yeah i mean okay so there's this guy on on twitter i don't know if anybody else follows him his name is peter schiff he's kind of like a meme mm -hmm. he's he's like the anti-crypto guy he's always posting like get out of bitcoin before you can like he's posting charts like this is or maybe he's not posting charts but he's like this is the signal that bitcoin's going to zero like he and the uh, and the Bitcoin world was always like have fun being poor. You know, he's obviously like a very rich guy. Yeah. Um, and it was a meme. But now, like, he's been right. Like things have been going down. And one of the things that Peter Schiff would always say is like buy gold and silver. And I I, I was always like kind of teasing him. Not really. Like I, I posted a couple things like, oh, when Peter Schiff says get out before you can, I always buy Bitcoin. I feel like it's like because he's always wrong. Um, but I decided to buy some gold and now I have gold. I, I, I mean, is it because I'm in my forties? I don't know. I wish that they could, I would buy gold if they would like send me the gold bricks and I could just like keep them in they my did? house. Oh really? I, that's what I did. No, but like, like a big gold brick, like a oh, $30,000 brick oh, dude, or like a hundred thousand. You can buy it. Like I, I, okay. So the place that I bought it from, I did a lot of research. It's uh bullion exchanges. It's like this New York company. And I'll drop a link for them um, in the video if you guys are interested. But I I did my research and I was like, I want to make sure that I get like pure gold. Like yeah. I don't want to get scammed here. So I ended up just buying like a couple thousand dollars worth of gold. And I didn't really know what it was going to be like once they sent it to me. And it showed up in these like packets. I don't have them on me, but I'll show, I'll show some B-roll for, for the audience. And they're like mini gold bars. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and then I started. Can you use it as a card protector at the poker table? Yeah, but they'll get dirty, you know, like. Okay. I just like keep them in their casing. Yeah, yeah. And keep them in the safe. Okay. People say if like the world goes to shit, like gold will always be something that you can barter with. You know, it'll always have value. And so it's, a, and now that I actually have it in my possession, I've like held gold bars in my yeah. hand. I actually like it. Huh. Like if okay. it feels like I'm almost like baseball cards. You know, where like you have this like attachment to a physical thing. With crypto, you don't have that. It's like this like imaginary like money that lives on the blockchain on the Internet. Uh, but like now I have these little gold bars that sit in my safe and I like pull them out every once in a while and look at them. I don't know. It's it's been really fun to have. And uh, the value actually hasn't gone down like the crypto value has gone down. And Peter Schiff says that that's what you need to buy to withstand all this inflation and all this other stuff. So I'm definitely not an expert, but I think it's fun to diversify. And now I have cryptocurrency. Now I have gold bars, even though it's only a couple thousand dollars worth. And yes, if you want a $50,000 gold bar, you can source that from the same place. I, I'm like kind of a all in or nothing kind of guy in general. <laughs> like I like to go big. I'm like, if, if they could send me i don't know and and also i like picture like these mr t like big gold chains of like solid gold why not do it like that why have it in a bar the the rappers do that yeah i mean <laughs> i don't know and then they wear it around their neck and but see i guess yeah you're gonna i'm not i'm not gonna wear a fifty thousand dollar necklace out to like <laughs> you know potentially get robbed or whatever but um I don't know, maybe like a piece of artwork or something, like a gold yeah. piece of artwork. Obviously, there's so many investment vehicles. Artwork is another thing that you can invest in, collecting gold bars. Um, but yeah, so anyways, it's it's been a fun thing for me. I, I bought real estate. As in Cabo, other, right? Yeah, I bought real estate in Cabo. So, so I've been like diversifying my funds at kind of the right time. You know, like I pulled out of crypto. You some, bought this apartment, right? I bought this apartment. So... And we'll get into like some of the reasons I've been able to do this stuff. Like the ape made me hundreds of thousands of dollars. That was enough for to buy Cabo. And then I had a tournament score. You uh, you definitely did. Bro, you're not the only tournament player in the family. I know. You, and you know what? Like in all seriousness, uh, I, I started off the summer pretty poor and you were doing well. I mean, that was the only thing that made me feel good about like things not going well was that I feel like you've been due. I feel like, you know, it, you've been getting close. You've done a lot of work. You're obviously a great player. Uh, and I want, you know, people in our family, people in our lives, people on the Internet to know you're just as capable, if not more capable. And, you know, when I was watching you have all these runs, it was it was great because I was I was kind of miserable. You know, it's pretty easy to become miserable in, in tournament poker. So, yeah, it's been it's been fun watching you. Yeah, I had um, WSOP was this is actually my first summer 
of committing to playing tournaments every day. In 2019, I made a little prop bet with Sean Deeb that I would do better in the tournaments that we mutually played because um, there was a big thing about him saying that I wasn't a capable poker player and I wanted to kind of prove that I was. So I made a little prop bet with him and I only played the tournaments that were on the weekends, you know, like the, the millionaire maker, the monster stack, the big 50, the, like the large field ones. And so the sample size was pretty small and I was able to win that prop bet mostly because he didn't even really care about those tournaments. He would like, so in some cases he would register them and then go play like a stud or something and then like check back in on his no limit table, go all in a couple times. So my ROI is naturally just going to be better in those tournaments. But like that added up to like maybe nine tournaments that summer. So it wasn't really a good sample size for me to uh, test my how good I am at tournaments. And then occasionally here and there I would mix them in because you were having so much success and you were really loving it. And like my competitive juices were kind of getting fl uh, started getting flow started flowing. So I've been mixing them in. I had a deep run at a WPT um, for nearly 10K. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, you did the same thing in the, the WPT. I feel like every time I have a score, you just one up me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a 30th place this summer. OK, so getting back, this is like the first summer that I've committed to playing every single day and not playing cash games. So I, I have a couple like deep runs early on in the World Series. I have a 31st place and a 30th place. Both in 3K events, both and for big six, fields, both big fields, both for sixteen thousand dollars. So it got me off to a great start. Like you said, uh, you were not doing well at the beginning, but then you turned it around. Yeah, and that's the thing about tournament poker is that you know it, it's not going well until it's going well. It, it, like it just changes that quickly. Uh, and even even in like a there was a tournament recently, the little one. I was fairly deep, and I was chip leading on on day three. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was like the end of day two and I was like, I don't know, below average. And then I just bagged almost the chip lead in the next like hour. And then like in the next, the first two levels of the day of, of day three, I went from like 2 million to 5 million. So it was essentially like four levels that I went from 400 K to 5 million. Yeah. You know, and it's like, that's kind of how tournament poker works. Like you just hang around, you do your best, you hope for good spots. Generally speaking, you know, you, you just kind of hope to move on. And then all of a sudden you catch fire. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it can, you it can change a, quickly. You had a big score at the win. Yeah. That was actually really fun. I, there, there's not much coverage at the win. You know, there's no like poker go there. There's no ca video cameras there. Poker news is there, but it's pretty sparse. This was the $3,500 win poker championship. And I just decided to pull out my phone and live stream the entire thing. That was cool. On Instagram. Yeah. And so it was like vertical video. I'm like running in there trying to get boards. I'm, I'm actually like talking out the hands like, oh, Andrew has a range advantage here. He's going to see about this a high percentage of the time. He's going to get a full high percentage of the time. So I'm like actually calling the play by play too. It was a lot of fun. The, the best memory I have from that was when I, we were three handed and they had been bringing up deal. I think when we got like six handed just to discuss it. And I was not the chip leader, but I was close to it. And I just didn't want to do a deal six handed, but each time I was like, look, if you guys want to discuss deal, that's fine. Potentially, if people wanted to give me more money, I would consider it more than anything. I just like it's kind of nice to take breaks. So then then they would pause the tournament come and I was six handed, no deal, five handed, no deal, four handed, no deal, three handed, um, no deal. It was brought up each time. Uh, but I actually brought up potentially doing a deal three handed. Um, and then ultimately we couldn't uh, we couldn't come to an agreement. Um, so yeah, we didn't do a deal and then we were three handed. I got all in, or the one player was shorter than me. Uh, he shoves, I have pocket eights in the small blind I call and we've just flop a set against King queen, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so we like basically have him dead and you guys all run over to me and like, we're just jumping up and down, celebrating, cheering. That was so much fun. It was like, yeah, you know, those are the moments that the soccer chant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It yeah, so yeah. It's just like, the, the, it's just like electric, you know, everyone's yeah. jumping up and down and celebrating. Even the other guy, like that's th that my opponent heads up is like very happy because, you know, we've just made a bunch more money, like, you know, a little bit more pressure is off. So 
the only person that's not happy is the guy that got yeah. third place or whatever. But um, yeah, it was crazy. Um, You've had a lot of those moments. You've had at yeah. the win when you won the 1.5 million. You have had big moments on the stage at the Thunderdome at the WSOP where you didn't actually win the tournament, but like there was pivotal moments. Like yeah. I remember an ace king versus aces. Oh God, yeah. That was day five of the main event. Um, last hand before dinner, it was... A guy just raised and I had ace king suited or ace king suited. I don't know. It's ace king. I go all in. This is like four or five years ago. Yeah. 2015. Okay. Then, seven years ago. Yeah. Wow. And then it just, uh, the big blind and looks down at his head and me and goes, I'm all in. Instantly. I was like, <laughs> I was like, can I take this back? Do you I didn't know many, he was going to do that. <laughs> do, you, do you know how many people were left at this point? So it was day five dinner break, roughly like, like maybe. 150 left. Yeah. So yeah. Pretty and well. like we just happened to be there i think yeah. it's maybe because you were getting ready to go on dinner so we were yeah. like well i was at a feature table oh you were at a feature table that's right yeah and um, uh i walk over to my family you guys my mom is on the rails like mom yeah i know you don't know kind of exactly what's going on but i'm about to bust the tournament it's going to be pretty sad i'm going to be pretty bummed out about it but i want you to know yeah it's going to be okay and she's just like oh okay you know and so like i'm just sitting up there with you christy and my mom and we're like looking up at the TV screen and the guy has aces, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they show the first card, it's a king. And then the dealer fans out the flop and the card right behind it's a king. So mm -hmm. it's like king, king five or something. And we just like, we just lost it. Everyone's celebrating. My mom's so confused now because she's like, wait, I thought we were going to lose. She's <laughs> like, what happened? I thought you were out of the tournament. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, uh, probably not. Uh, yeah. She's like, it was why did you lie to me? <laughs> insane celebration. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like I essentially like lying to my mom in like the most <laughs> cruel way. And anyway, that was like probably the luckiest I've ever gotten for, especially for like yeah. the most amount of EV. Uh, I, I mean, tournaments I, are wild like that. I can personally remember like at least four to five moments where we've had this with you, mm -hmm. where we like jumping up and down, celebrating, and I've never actually had that moment mm. for myself. That's interesting. I, I, I have had the one deep run at. Um, at Venetian where I got second place. This is, uh, I won $125,000 a couple of months, about six months, four months ago. And that was actually enough for a down payment on this place, um, which is how I got the two places. And then, um, but you weren't there. I know. And they had it in a, um, they had it in an area that was like not good for spectators. Um, the wind does a better job of like creating an area for spectators. People were behind a glass, yeah. you know? So when I did win pots, like, there wasn't the same kind of energy, mm -hmm. you know? So I am looking forward to the day where I get to have those, like, we will make it happen where we get to have those special moments. Cause honestly that I feels like that's what it's all about. Yeah. I mean the, the thing about tournaments that's so alluring to people, obviously the big prize pools and the big first places like catch your eye and they're exciting to play for, but it's the extreme emotion, the, the, the big highs, the, 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 the deep lows where you're just like, miserable like feeling like you can't do it and then all of a sudden there's a glimmer of hope and you grab onto it and you catch lightning and you just you know you're like riding high and it's like the main events happening right now one of our friends is in the final 30 players uh he was the chip leader i think he's still in the top top, top three five, five, so, top yeah. five um and we were there last night just supporting and um I mean, to be quite honest, I don't know if he could do it without us there drinking and yelling every time he wins a hand. Yeah. Uh, because that's what you do. And obviously I'm kidding, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got no reaction. I'm like, is he, is he like taking our energy and like injecting <laughs> it into them? So is that where you're going with but, this? Because but, like when you celebrate, like when you're there drinking and celebrating when they win hands, in my mind, that's like kind of like how I have it framed. Like the only way he can possibly play this tournament is if we fucking go nuts every time he wins Honestly, a pot. Honestly, <laughs> I feel like there's something to it, though, because I got tired in my heads-up mm -hmm. battle. Yeah. If I had people yelling and, like, feeding into my adrenaline, I feel like it could have helped me sustain for longer. Yeah. And, and it obviously, if it doesn't do that, it creates a much more enjoyable experience. Like, he, Brian Kim is the guy that's in the final um, uh, 30 here, and... and He's a very like silent assassin kind of guy, you know, and with us like making all this noise and going crazy, he's smiling. 
Mm-hmm. He's looking back and like yeah. giving us. He came up. over and celebrated after a big pot he yeah. won. It was so great, you know, because Brian's very like, he's he's a killer at the table. I don't see him often celebrate or anything around poker. He's just uh, very stoic. But then when he came over and celebrated with us, he's like, he's you can't deny the electric energy of the main event and winning, you know, a twenty million chip pot. Yeah, um, and, and it was great to see him just. We had those moments with Gary Gates. Yeah, our crew. So Gary Gates got third place one year. I finished in 28th. Brian's very likely going to final table and, and win this Max thing. And then Max Steinberg. Max yeah. Steinberg finished we've been, third or fourth place. We've yeah. been very lucky with our core friend group just mm-hmm. ripping off huge runs in the main event here. And we've actually had some pieces too, which yeah. is great. We had a piece of Max. Um, I yeah. didn't have a piece of Gary. No, I didn't have it. No. Yeah, but like he's such a good friend that it still yeah. felt like so amazing to be there, you know. And then now we have a piece of Brian, which ha- it was like happenstance that we had a piece of Brian. Like we've had this group chat for 15 years or so. Yeah. And one day Brian's like, hey, guys, in the group chat, he's like, can we just do like a main event swap with every single person in this group chat for one percent? And, and only on top 36. Yeah. If somebody gets top 36, like obviously we're all going to be there rooting each other on. So it's going to be an insane moment for the whole crew. So let's just swap 1% so that if it, if it ever happens, we have like extra juice when we get there, you know? So, and he's the one that pulled it off. So thank you, Brian, for uh, texting in the group chat. The thing about like having a piece, it's always like a weird thing for me because you like, they know that you're kind of more excited to cheer for them because you have a piece, but it's not all about me. Like when I was there yesterday supporting and cheering, obviously like I was like hoping that he got top 36 for my own financial gain or whatever. But like more than anything, I'm just like, there, like super happy and rooting for your friend. And Mm -hmm. you know, it is though like a weird kind of thing where you're like, you're talking like, you know, Christy and I have 1% each. You have a percent. Like if he wins $10 million, like we, we just make 300 K like that's, that's crazy. Like, yeah, you know, that amount of money, like you can definitely feel emotion about like him winning and losing pots. It's, it's kind of a weird feeling. People always ask the question. I, that's like the number one question in my DMs mm-hmm. when I'm like, because I, I have like a large circle of friends here in poker. So when one of them is running deep, I'm I'm propping them up. I'm like, guys, check out my friend. Like he's running deep. I'm so excited. Number one question I get in my DMs. How much do you have? Like what piece of percentage yeah. you have? Um, you, It's usually like, one percent or no, or nothing and the number because you win every tournament and go deep in all these tournaments people are always asking me how much percentage do you have of andrew in this tournament and usually it's zero well i hate accident. that it, i hate that yeah because like <laughs> we 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 swap five percent on mutually played events yeah so any event that we both play together we have a, a agreement that we don't even need to type in a chat or anything we just know if we both play the same tournament we have 5% swap. So it, it's like automatic. And for some reason, the, the tournaments that Andrew's d- done really well in have been the tournaments that I've decided to not play. So since I didn't play them, it wasn't there wasn't yeah. a swap there. So the, the one at the win was like, I have another deal with Alex Livingston, same thing, mutually played. I texted him uh, the morning before the final table. I was like, did you play this event? And he ended in, did not end up playing it. And it's, you know, I cashed for almost half a million dollars. It's like, you know, yeah, that's a significant, I get it for, for you know, it's it's unfortunate, but I, I would love to pay you out. And, I, and I'm and i sure at some point, like we'll be paying each other out. Yeah. Uh, numerous it, times. It'll, it'll happen yeah. eventually. Yeah. Um, now that I'm playing more tournaments and I, I'm not sure exactly what your tournament schedule is going to be like. I know you've been like thinking about maybe uh, being more selective with your tournament schedule. But yeah, um, it's it's been a fun summer. I've cashed for over $45,000, maybe close to $50,000, um, but not really a profit, mm-hmm. basically breaking even. and um, But a ton of experience and a couple deep runs that where I felt like, you know, you got that feeling inside where I was like, oh, okay, this is a lot of fun. I, I want to keep doing this every once in a while. And you've cashed for probably half a million or so. Yeah, um, I think I've played 20 events. I'm profit around somewhere north of 400k yeah um i don't know exactly but you know that's the thing i i don't really know what i want to do i told my wife christy i was like look let me just focus on studying and playing after our son was born 
and I want to work really hard and play through the World Series and then kind of take a step back and, and look at everything. And one thing I realized playing this summer is that I don't think this is what I want to do. I don't think I want to be a tournament player. It's, yeah. it's a very stressful way to make a living. And to be quite honest, like between taxes and the amount of pressure that you have and expenses family expenses and yeah and, and you're like you're gone you, you like have to be gone yeah um i just don't really see the big thing for me is the stress yeah you put yourself in situations where you have to do well in like really high pressure moments that uh have a lot of big equity so it could be one singular decision you know maybe you're on the on the river with a bluff candidate uh, with you know three tables left and you decide to pull the trigger and the guy calls and you bust and you make you know a very very small profit or you get the bluff through and you become the chip leader and you get second place like in my case in the in the win tournament and it's like you know the ev difference of like because i make half a million here or i would have cashed for like you know yeah. nine thousand or something it's like you continually put yourself in these situations where what you do really matters. And if it doesn't work out, it's, it's so stressful. Yeah. And I just like, I come home and I see my, my beautiful son and my wife and I'm like, she's beautiful too. Uh, <laughs> and you know, shout I, out I, to Christy Arnett. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just want to like love them and be with them and spend time with them. But I, I, I wear the emotion a lot. It's so hard to, to cleanse myself of that and just yeah. like leave it at work, so to speak. So yeah, I'm really going to have to figure out, I noticed one of the things that you've been doing is uh, you've been doing coaching and Mm -hmm. something that you actually enjoy doing a lot more than myself. um, You're also a much better coach in general, but um, I, I think that that's one way you could like create some more stability in your life is like actually taking on students and helping them become beast tournament players or beast cash game players because you obviously have experience in both. Um, And, and one of your students actually, yeah. Oh my God. So cool. So this guy, uh, he's a Canadian guy, um, entrepreneur, not a professional player, but he's, he's like, he's a very serious poker player, very smart guy, has a good understanding of cash game poker, doesn't play tournaments. Um, so we've been working together for the last few months leading up to the world series. And, uh, he had a deep run right away and, uh, maybe like a three K or something finished top final two tables or something. Um, and he's very aggressive, very loose. Uh, and one of the things that I've really tried to work with him on is I want him to be who he is at the poker table. I want him to be able to get in there, make those big bluffs, the big calls, push people around, but just like refine those skills, like rein it back a little bit in certain spots. And so this year he was going deep in the main. It was like day two, day three, and we're talking through spots, day four, day five, day six. And he's just a wild man. Like he was, you know, and, and so I was, you know, kind of in an interesting spot where I was like, you know, trying to keep him from punting his stack off, but also, uh, allow him to continually build a stack. And, and I think, you know, credit to him, he, he played great and he did uh, a lot of unconventional things that I would never have done. Even like the last hand that he doubled up, like most pros wouldn't have doubled up there, but he played it really aggressively and, and found the double. So, um, you know, he was really crushed at the end. I think he did some things that were, uh, he got caught up in the moment of, you know, like everything was kind of seemingly working. He was, he was pushing people around and then, um, you know, he made a substantial mistake and it's really, you know, what I told him last night when he busted, which is so true is like, he's not a professional poker player. He's never been here. He's, he, he's put all of his time and energy into creating businesses and, you know, cultivating this relationship with his fiance and, you know, he's, that's his focus. So when he gets to this stage, it's really, he should have, and this goes to anyone out there that's not a professional player that, that hasn't studied or prepared, you know, you did the best you could with what you knew. And, you know, your focus is these, these other things. And if you had studied a bunch and made this your life and decided this is what you were going to do, sure. And you got there and you made this mistake, then probably feel a lot worse about it. But he didn't. He's never been there. Um, it's really easy without the experience to get caught up in the moment and kind of get carried away. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so 
Yeah, he was devastated, but I, I think when the dust settles, it's an incredible result. He finished like 40th place. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, the the main event for me is we both did not have success in this year's main event. I actually busted on day one before the dinner break. First time I've ever done that. I played it nine times, cash five times, busted on day two once, and then all the other times I busted on day three where I didn't make the money. So I fully expected to just kind of waltz in there and – same thing as before, make it to at least day three and have some spots, you know, but did not go well for me. And busting the main event is definitely one of the worst days of the year for a poker player because your expectations are, I'm going to play great. I'm going to run well and things are, and I'm going to be Brian Kim with all my friends, like at the, at the rail, you know, supporting me and kind of the same thing for you this year. But for me, it's also a cleansing event. I feel like every time the main event is over, uh, cause it's something that I play every year, even though I'm not a tournament player until more recently afterwards, I always have like this new, like, okay, what's the plan? Like, what's the plan coming into the fall? Like, what am I going to do with my life? I feel like it's always this turning point. Like mm -hmm. there's before the main event yeah, and then there's after it kind of signifies the end of the world series and the end of like the poker grind for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. So the summer is coming to a halt here in Las Vegas, but the content is going to be stepping up. Embrace the grind is back now that we have this living room set up for podcasting. Olga and I are also going to be making some other content that we're really excited about. And of course, I'm going to be playing poker a bunch, going to be back to uploading on my normal channel. Yeah. And uh, if you guys have any topics you want us to cover, anything that you think is interesting or uh, any questions you have for us or guests that you'd like to see, uh, we would love to hear from you guys and just kind of take in that input and make this kind of show what we think it can be, which is a really big show. And um yeah, we're just really excited to have you guys along along for the ride. Thanks for embracing the grind, guys. We'll see you in yeah. a future episode. Yeah.